Welcome back, everybody. Uh, good to have you. Um, we're about to finish our discussion of the GNSS orbits. In particular, we're going to take on a, a very fun topic, and uh, it's uh, a couple of details associated with the nav message and things that you'll need to know if you're opening up GPS nav messages and, uh, and doing position fixing. This uh, view graph uh, shows the so-called anomalies, which is ancient language uh, equivalent to angles. And in fact, there are three anomalies of interest to GPS and which you must use to process the data. They're the true anomaly, the eccentric anomaly, and the mean anomaly. And we'll go through them here. The true anomaly is the familiar one. We've already talked about that. Here I have drawn um, a uh, orbit, a nice elliptical orbit here. And uh, here's the satellite right here. Sorry, that's the Earth, of course. Here's the satellite up here. And the angle made by the satellite past perigee is the true anomaly. And we've talked about that one. It's certainly a very uh, physical one uh, here uh, with this simple drawing. There's no ambiguity about what uh, that angle is. And, um, and so it's very, very visual that way. When we're translating back and forth between the true anomaly and the data that we get from GPS, we have to pass through a, a calculation involving the so-called eccentric anomaly. So let's define that. The eccentric anomaly is here. It's defined relative to the center of the ellipse. So not either of the foci, but uh, right here at the center. And recall that the distance from either of the far edges of the ellipse into the center is the semi-major axis. So we're right here in the center. And to define this angle, we take and we project a line up from the semi-major axis through the satellite to strike this circle, which just barely encloses the ellipse. So the circle has a radius equal to A, or equal A. And with that radius, we can just barely enclose the orbital ellipse inside there. And so if we draw this line perpendicular to the semi-major axis, punch through the satellite, and continue until we reach that enclosing circle, <laughs> we can now define a vector from the center of the system up to that point, so defined, and the angle made by that vector and perigee is equal to capital E, or the eccentric anomaly. So uh, the true anomaly is the easiest one to visualize. The eccentric anomaly is getting a little bit more abstract, but we can still draw it. The mean anomaly is very difficult to even draw. We have to think about it a different way. And uh, that definition appears over here on the left-hand side of the view graph. And recall that the period of a satellite going around its orbit, given by Kepler, is given by this first expression here. So capital T is equal to 2 uh, pi times a to the 3 halves divided by the square root of mu. That's the orbital period. Sometimes this has a little bit more fancified uh, of a symbol, uh, this um, a fancy p. But if we have that orbital period, we're well on our way to defining the mean anomaly. So consider then that it takes capital T to go all the way around. That means that the average speed, the average angular speed of the satellite as it goes around that orbit is 2 pi radians, that's the complete trip around, divided by that capital T. <clears throat> and here we have a neat expression for that as a function of mu and uh, the semi-major axis cubed. And so that expression uh, is uh, shown right here. Consider a satellite that would be difficult to draw, but which is prog progressing uniformly with a, a constant angular speed. And that angular speed is given by this n, the mean motion defined as 2 pi divided by capital T. And if we then think about the angle 
that that satellite is making, then it would be equal to capital M, that's the mean anomaly, times whatever mean anomaly it started at, plus this mean motion times the lapse time. So that's quite a bit abstract, not so easy to draw here, but the thing I invite you to do is hang on to this notion that this uh, abstracted satellite is proceeding with the average speed, the mean motion required to get all the way around the orbit in the orbital period. So, <clears throat> appreciate that all of these numbers are slightly different. If you were to plot nu, e, and m for a GPS satellite, they would be occasionally equal, but they generally kind of fluctuate relative to each other. There's one exception. And that is if the eccentricity is equal to zero, if in fact the orbit is not elliptical, it's perfectly circular. In that case, and that case only, nu is equal to e is equal to m. The true anomaly will be equal to e because for that circular orbit, Earth will be at the center of the system, and uh, the Enclosing circle will be enclosing a circle, so those two things will be identical. So nu and e would be identical. And the mean motion, the 2 pi divided by capital T, would be uniform and correct for describing the satellite moment by moment. Now, <clears throat> what do we get when we get information from GPS? We really get the mean motion, and we project it forward by the time since that mean motion was initiated, or the epoch time associated with the, the mean motion calculation. We have capital M in our hand. We use that and this equation, which is called Kepler's equation, to solve for the eccentric anomaly, capital E. And then when we have capital E in hand, we're able to solve for the true anomaly. So these are the steps that your receiver and your calculations must go through if you're going to unpack and use the GPS navigation information to really determine the Keplerian parameters. Only after you've gone through these steps will you have new, and recall that's the sixth of the Keplerian parameters, and what's used to define the satellite location in the parafocal plane. Now we'll talk about uh, departures from the 1 over r squared model that Newton used to establish the correctness of the Keplerian parameters. And if what we had was simply what's shown here, a perfectly spherical Earth, homogeneous in density, and the only other object in space was our satellite, then uh, the 1 over r squared law would be ruling the roost. It would be the only thing in force and the Keplerian parameters would be a perfect description of the satellite orbit. However, we have some complications. One of them is that the Earth is not homogeneous. It's lumpy. So we can't all of a sudden take this homogeneous perfect sphere, collapse it down to a point with mass equal to the Earth, and solve that 1 over r squared fundamental orbital differential equation, we have a more complicated deal. <clears throat> and so as the satellite goes around the Earth, it's subject to more or less force, not necessarily always pointing right towards the Earth's center, and so that's a perturbation that we have to cope with. The next one, <clears throat> excuse me, Neil. Uh, the next one is that it's not a two-body problem. We, we had this wish, we established it early on, uh, that it was only the Earth and the satellite, but here we have the sun in the lower left and the moon in the upper right, and they too uh, influence the motion of the satellite. Recall that when we first wrote the gravitational impact on a satellite, we wrote it as if there were capital J bodies in the system, and so it's it's certainly easy to go ahead and imagine how to expand the uh, processing to account for the moon and the sun, 
but you do need to know exactly where the moon and the sun are relative to the Earth to go ahead and, and do those uh, corrections. So that we call third bodies. If the satellite were closer to the Earth, then we would also have a slowing force due to the, um, I shouldn't call it a slowing force, a dissipative uh, effect due to the atmospheric drag. As a satellite goes through uh, the Earth's atmosphere, if, we're, if we were, let's say, in low Earth orbit, then uh, we would have a force in opposition to the direction of the satellite. Let's say the satellite is going this way, as shown in the orbit, and then the impact of blue would be to have a force in the opposite direction. And we call that atmospheric drag. Uh, we put it here for this GPS case, uh, mostly academically, because the GPS satellites are way up in medium Earth orbit, and there's very little effect from atmospheric drag. The important ones are higher order gravity, the lumpy Earth, the third body effects from the uh, moon and the sun, and the next one that plays a small role is the solar radiation pressure. So the photons from the sun strike the spacecraft and tend to push it out in this direction away from the sun. And so that's a, that's a small force. By the way, this elegant illustration was created by Tyler Reed. Uh, he's a graduate student here at Stanford University working in this area, so I thank him for this nice picture. The impact of all this is that when you look at the ephemeris parameters in the GPS nav message, you find the ones that you expect. Semi-major axis, eccentricity, inclination, longitude of the ascending node, argument of perigee, mean anomaly, all these things that we've talked about. We know that we have to process this to get the true anomaly, but uh, we've talked about how to do that. However, here, are contained the results and the compensation for these higher order forces that we just saw in Tyler's diagram. We may have a mean motion that we would think would be correct for a satellite in this orbit, but we have to have a small correction on that to take care of some of those perturbations. <coughs> Here is inclination. Recall that gives the uh, angle of the orbital plane relative to the equatorial plane. But see there that we're including a first derivative for it. So kind of a linear effect that we use to pick up some of the perturbations. Same thing is true for capital omega. And so the GPS nav mes message includes capital omega dot. In addition, to these secular terms, these are called secular because they just advance with time, we have periodic terms. And in fact, we have them for both sine and cosine, so think of kind of a four-year series correction. Uh, and the first one is to the argument of latitude, orbital radius, and the inclination angle for the third one. And they give periodic corrections to those as they should because they're correcting for the lumpiness of the Earth. So as you go around, you experience the same lumpiness on every orbital pass. And so that's why they're picked up that way. When we come back, we'll switch gears, stop talking about the orbits, and start to talk more deeply about the GNSS signals. I look forward to that.